So thank you everyone for tuning in to Kanana Show. For the new people, uh, everyone that is first time, as you know, uh, we are here to help nomad experts give tips. And every time we're hosting someone that is really into, into his first step of nomading or already been there for a while and can give us like kind of expert tips. Um, so today with us, we have special guest, Anna, please. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, introduce yourself, yeah. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm yeah. Anna Maria. I'm originally from Poland, but I have been a nomad since 2017. I've been also a digital nomad ambassador. So, I work remotely like long before COVID. Uh, I worked as a project manager in digital transformation projects. And then I also started to consult on remote work and I also help like uh, destinations and organizations to attract nomads and remote workers. And uh, yeah, so I'm full-time nomads Amazing. nowadays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so really expert nomad uh, for the past, I guess, decade, uh, you can say? Something like um, that? I don't know, five years, maybe. Five uh, years. Five years. I have yeah. been a traveler, you know, like that, of course. Like I've been an expat for many years. Mm -hmm. I traveled a lot. So for me, it was, I would say, like progressive change. Like I didn't went from living in one country to be nomad. So I guess also that was, um, the change was not that big, right? But, but yeah. Nice. Uh, so as always, we have a couple of questions that we are always asking uh, our guests. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to speak a little bit about nomading. Uh, and obviously, we can give us a little bit of uh, pro tips and gems that can help newbies and even people that are been a while uh, in their journey. Um, so what would you say for someone that just, you know, starting or about to start uh, his journey as a nomad? For someone that's starting, you know, like first thing is the income, right? Stable income, because sometimes people confuse like uh, being nomad with actually having a job. So being nomad is a lifestyle. It's not a job. And uh, then there is no such a thing like working as a nomad. Then you have to figure out how you're going to sustain yourself. And that means like finding a stable remote uh, job or maybe freelancing, or opening your own business. And actually in this order, <laughs> because finding remote job is the easiest thing, uh, obviously like finding your own clients or even establishing like, you know, uh, the whole business and processes is more complex. Uh, but it all depends like where you are. Maybe some people are freelancers already, in, you know, in their countries, then actually for them, like uh, going nomad, uh, maybe a different path that for someone that maybe was working corporate life. So it's really a bit individual but of course you have to assure that this is stable right and then i would say that you should have at least like maybe for half a year uh, savings so you can um, live on that even if someone didn't pay or something happens like you should have that um that safety i would say economical and mm -hmm. once that is set uh, so that's like the most uh, important part then you can join like i would say nomad communities you know like there are lots of people they travel individually of course uh, maybe they go to remote places and there are no communities but i think for someone that starts it's really beneficial and it's really useful because you don't really have to reinvent the wheel a lot of people like they have when they start they have the questions that other people already they have the replies to that questions right like they figure that out they set that out so you don't have to do everything by yourself especially nowadays maybe like 10 years ago if you would start there were not so many communities or they were not so organized so it was more lonely and i think also more complicated mm -hmm. Now uh, you you can really benefit uh, from those groups. So they're like online groups. Uh, some of them, they are paid. Some of them, they are for free. There is a lot of groups in Facebook. So for a random question, you can also like just go on Facebook group in the destination where you want to go. Then there are also communities that meet in person in different destinations or they travel together. I'm part of them. So 
as many you know mm -hmm. as you can join that that's gonna be better for you there are also like big nomad events you know like festival of conferences and i think like especially someone that starts they are the one to benefit of that the most because everything that they're gonna say is is kind of discovery probably so it's it's really mm -hmm. worth to go then and figure out and then you will like learn much more about this lifestyle but also like you know how to deal with everything uh, how to find friends how to travel how to be productive so there is there are already a lot of knowledge and people that have that knowledge mm -hmm. um yeah ah and i think also something that maybe we shouldn't skip because sometimes people can have like the right skills you know to find the job or even to set their own business but they don't maybe have the necessary mindset so that's if you don't believe that this is possible for you for whatever reason like mm -hmm. and there is something blocking you then you will find a reason not to do it you know so sometimes we need to work on that first like you really need to believe that this is possible uh you know like for me for instance to to give you an example i heard about the term digital nomads in 2015 and 2015, so before COVID, there was no remote job, like no, no kind of job that you can still work for a company. So most of nomads by then, they were all their like programmers, maybe some designer, maybe someone writer, and maybe someone that had their own business and they could decide whatever they do. So very, uh, I would say like two, three kind of jobs, and I didn't have any of those skills. So I just look at that and say like, so this looks awesome, but I just can't do it. I don't have any technical skills. I also don't know how to design. And I just, you know, abandoned the whole idea. I didn't do anything like for two years because I had that belief that this is only those people can be nomads, right? And um, then I moved to Lisbon, but I moved as an expat, so I was not even a nomad. Uh, and there just happened to be like the biggest nomad community in Lisbon um, that we have in Europe nowadays. So I just went to those meetups and then suddenly there were like hundreds, yeah, hundreds, sometimes 150, 200 people on a meetup. And then I realized that some of these people, in order to become nomads, they went really creative. So they invented like their own jobs. Maybe there was no job they created for themselves. You know, they started consult on something or coaching or they open some, you know, start to provide some service so they could work online. They change their careers. And you see, like, I didn't even thought about that. I thought, OK, right, I'm not programmer or I'm not designer. That's it. But that made me realize, OK, so this is actually possible, right? And from them, since that changed my mindset, then I started like more actively looking, okay, so how I can do that for myself, but from a different position, like really believing that this is possible. So it's just like a matter of when and how we start. So this step also might be critical, I think. All right. Yeah. And first of all, thank you for that. That's amazing. Like you actually gave, you know, from beginning to the end, the most important things maybe to, to experts. So let's take for a second, like a step back and talk about the beginning. Okay. So we're talking a lot about like mindset and obviously your journey started by like not believing it's possible or I don't have the, the skill that needed or I need clients, where do I find clients? All of those kind of things that beginners, that newbies, no matter where they stand in the scale, they kind of, you know, really intimidated by. Um, so basically, what would you say professions that you can start right away uh, without, you know, big skills or marketing skill, writing skill, creative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that someone, you know, can already start as a side gig and later on move onward to a full time and actually be, a, you know, full time nomad with his job? Yeah, but this really depends like what what those people are doing normally, because nowadays you can find like the job that was maybe traditionally in office, but now is remote and it doesn't necessarily is programming. You can be nowadays like accountant or work in finance or be a manager and work remotely, you know. So it's now a matter if you are fine with working for a company or finding a remote job. So without any specific skills. So that actually changed during pandemic because before the pandemic, you actually had to have some skills. If you didn't have them, then you had to acquire them. Or maybe that meant that you need to transition and change your career to be able to work remotely. So now there are more possibilities in a sense 
that if you had more traditional career, but you are now able to work remotely, you know, like lots of people in sales, in marketing, in portraits, um, yeah, finance, they now are able to get remote job. It's of course not the majority of jobs, but it's possible. So now it becomes actually a think of how you find the remote job, like what are the skills needed and how you even, you know, um, get ahead because of course there are more candidates and like, people that are looking for remote jobs than the fully remote jobs. So this is like one way to go. Um, if not, there are some maybe simple things that you can do. There is a lot of demand, for instance, for social media management nowadays, virtual assistants, um, everything that has to do with videos, video editing, um, I think so maybe those things, they don't necessarily require you learning like programming or maybe even basic design, but very basic. I also have this, um, I think they call it Webflow developer, so they don't code. They just use the pages that they can design, like for instance, website dates. So that's something that you potentially can learn maybe in a few months, right? And then you would need to find, like get maybe first clients. Uh, you need to get out there, you're there, like build some portfolio. I would say like wait a little bit until you have some clients, then you start traveling. But that's also a way to go if you don't want to look for a remote job, right? So it's it really depends where you are. Like do you already have some skills or at least some interest? Or maybe you have like already established career and you just want to continue, but you now will look for the fully remote job instead of the own office job, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So kind of make the adjustment uh, to your career uh, yeah. to work online. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. And actually, um, in our agency, uh, a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the uh, team members actually started from you know working in the office or working in call centers and those kind of things and moved fully online like make the transition fully online uh, christine here can actually yeah. uh, relate <laughs> i can yes, definitely relate, relate. yeah for yep, me you need to establish here. um good communication skills when it comes to connecting to the client and of course i really agree with you anna it is the mindset that you need to really motivate yourself mm -hmm. and learn um, extra skills along the way and really motivate yourself to be a um, proactive learner. Yeah, just keep on learning along the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, all right. Um, so for newbies, it's obviously a lot about mindset, a lot about believing. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is like a big part of what we're doing. We're like we're talking with a lot of nomades, uh, people that have been around and just people that start their journey, uh, just to give the inspiration. Um, so what would you say, like give your sentence, your inspirational sentence uh, to newbie, to someone that wants to jump ahead uh, and actually start his journey as a nomad? Well, so if um, if they have any budget, it may be worth to work with some coach, you know, like mindset coach or digital nomad coach or remote uh, job coach. I coach people. They are amazing people like my friends. They can coach. So that can be done and that will, you know, like figure out what's actually blocking you or how to speed that process. But if they don't have any budget, then again, communities, because just being around the people that already did that can be uh, the you know the step that you need just like think it's possible for all of them because one thing is to see that like you know in some newspaper uh to see that in some like uh, edited video clip by someone that's already influential so this is one thing but it doesn't make people believe that this is belief for, uh, like this is possible for them but when you already go and surround yourself, and if you can in person, you know, like these events, meetups, conferences, like a uh, workshop, whatever they do, and then you see that there is a lot of people, just people like you, that they started, you know, like they were maybe like two or three years ago, they were just in the office and they didn't see a way how to get out of there. But now they are doing that, then it's just impossible to still think that it's hard. You know, it's just like the life proves you that it's mm -hmm. possible. So that for me, for me, it was enough, you know, like just going there and saying, OK, they have all done it. So I'm wrong. Right. <laughs> oh. Yeah, absolutely. And now, obviously, like thinking about going back is something that is 
impossible uh, to go back like yeah uh, uh, to an office life uh, nine to five etc etc mm-hmm. um all right and- uh, um Yeah, please go ahead, Tim. <laughs> and you know what, Ben? <laughs> Anna is actually like um, an inspiration to her company because she was the first one to work remotely and set, set us as an example to be a digital nomad in her company. And her company right now is actually accepting and um, pushing remote work as well. So I'm really happy, Anna, for you to like you really yeah. took the step. You're being the pioneer. You're really yeah. yeah. She really proved <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's something that people also would like to know because uh so um, nowadays at least half of people would like fully remote job. Mm-hmm. And when I'm saying fully remote, I don't just mean work from home because a lot of those jobs, they just won't work from home in one country, but they would like to travel, actually. They want to have that freedom. But we only have like less than 10% nowadays, like opening that are fully remote. And I think it's even less because many of them are not really fully remote, but they ad- advertise as such. So you see, there is big mismatch, right? Like so many people that want remote job, but so little re- fully remote positions. Like they are work from home, but then, you know, it's you can't really travel and go anywhere if you can just um, work in only in your country or in the country where you get the job. So it's completely different thing, despite that this big confusion, because everybody use now the term um, remote from UK, for instance, or remote from US. Mm-hmm. This is not remote. This is work from home. Remote means that I can go whenever I want. That's remote. <laughs> And uh, so because we have that mismatch, uh, of course, it's better to get a job um, if you go that direction in a company that's remote first, because then you will need, you know, they already have the processes set. They are prepared. They have the right mindset. They don't have that many um, meetings. They think about time zone differences. So everything is already in place. So you just, you know, like one piece more, but something that's already worked. Now, um, that would be the best. But because there are not enough of those job uh, openings, and maybe you can find something that you like as a job position, you are interested. Or maybe you even have job already, and you like it, and you don't want to leave it, but you would like to be a nomad. So that's where we need to be also, I would say we have to lead that change, not only just like, you know, take something that's already fully remote. And if not, then I'm not there. But it's, you know, we have nothing to lose to also propose that if you, for instance, have the job, like if you can work remotely and and probably you will need to push, not just propose, right? So like uh, present how that's going to be done, you know, like small trial period first. And if um, if not, then only then you need to start to look for something else. But I believe that there are companies that nobody challenged them. You know, they didn't need to think about that before. Nobody asked. Exactly. So, so they haven't advised as remote position because that was easier. They didn't have to figure out all these legal and compliance things. But if someone pushed, then they might be open. There is a possibility mm-hmm. because this happened to me, right? That was, I think, 2018. So the company was not remote. It was in Ukraine, by the way. And they basically needed someone that, um, yeah, in that moment. Um, and I just said, like, oh, that looks like a nice job offer, but I'm not moving to Ukraine right now. So are you open to remote work? You know, there was it costed me nothing to ask. So a lot of people would say, but they're going to say no, right? Well, so what do you have to lose, right? But they actually said, well, let's talk about it, right? So there is that, and that was 2018. So if that was possible then, uh, now it's like 10 times more possible because they already it's heard about the open. concept. Yes. So mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, if um, that may be, because that amplifies your chances, right? You don't have to look only at fully remote positions, but also companies that... You know they might be open and and then you will be able to establish those conditions that satisfy mm-hmm. you and um it's just like someone has to start right and someone has to show not everybody will be mm-hmm. open but you know some people might be open and anyway for them to be open they have to be asked by enough candidates That's like true. can i work remotely and then they you know start thinking who of course like uh also depends who is asking right so 
in order for you to have a good uh, position in a negotiation, you have to be a strong candidate. So they have to prefer you over someone that's local. How you get that? So you really need to acquire some skills. Like you have to have clearer what kind of job uh, I'm looking for, what I can do, what I can offer, why I'm more valuable as a remote candidate than someone that's already there. And this actually drives us the, maybe the other way that many people would think, because that requires you to spe specialize, focus on something, be something really good. Because applying on a lot of jobs that are, for instance, doesn't have any entrance barrier, like uh, maybe like some, you know, some data or introduction or customer service, then everybody can apply. So it's very competitive and very hard to get that job. Because literally everybody, and there is like no reason why they should choose you over someone else. But if you have already a you know, career in management or in marketing and you are good and you have, you know, like a good portfolio or you have the skills that not everybody has. Maybe you speak some languages, not part mm -hmm. of English. Then your position is stronger Then you are a better spot to mm -hmm. say, like, I'm interested. I can do this and this and this for you. I can get you that result. but I would like to work remotely. That's a different conversation That's that true. me going on LinkedIn, because, you know, I also receive messages from people every day, uh, DMs like, uh, Madame, can you help me to find a remote job? It doesn't work like that because there is too many people, not enough remote jobs. So you people will not hire you um, to make you a favor. You have to show them that you are better. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's on your side. Yeah, I totally agree. Like the market is really flow right now. Since the uh, pandemic, a lot of people try to get an online job, try to move even to, you know, adjust that career. But not only uh, I saw a lot of people opening their second career, uh, starting as a teacher or starting something educational and move fully to be a, a tutor online or to teach language. And um, a lot of, you know, creating things that you can do that really in line with the way that you want to live, uh, the way you choose to live. So the world, I think, really open a lot of offices, a lot of corporate even, um, understand that the remote is actually saving a lot of money to the company. So why not? Why not? Um, and I really like your attitude about like, go ahead and try. Uh, you have nothing to lose. Go ahead, be pushy, uh, make a plan, present it. Don't come to your boss and just, you know, hey, I want to work remote. That's it. Yes or no. If not, I'm leaving. No, this is not a way. You actually need to communicate. You need to try your best to actually build something that is realistic from the other side for the business a owner or your boss and to understand that it actually can benefit all side i'm going to be more productive i'm going to work better i'm going to spend less time speaking with my with my like boys over there from co-worker in the in the kitchen and i'm actually going to do the job i i'm going to save money to the to the company etc 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 and i really love mm -hmm. that too and it's really like something that really can push you uh, to the edge, not only push your, you know, the limits of your job, but push your limits and uh, get out of the comfort zone and actually imagine it better, how you can keep doing what you're doing, but in better condition, you can call it like better views, as you can see, and better, yeah, better hours or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so first of all, this is a nice thing and, and as well, Having someone that already been there and already doing that uh, as a coach, someone that can actually help you uh, either to build a plan or to build your personal brand as a nomad, uh, I think it's really something that uh, worth to look into. Um, I'm sure there's like, you know, even one small thing, me as someone that already been, you know, nomad a couple of times, um, still like a lot of things are, are you know, I'm always learning new things. I'm always like there are new hacks and stuff like that or new mindsets of people that I I totally if if I was like five years ago, I totally would apply it and probably cut a little bit of my time as not a nomad. 
Um, so yeah, uh, first of all, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, let's go back a little bit and talk about network. I know it's a huge thing, uh, especially for nomad uh, solo partners. Um, when it's getting lonely a little bit, when you're homesick, when you're always like in the drive to meet more people and get into, you know, and not miss anything more than anything. This is at least like my... my kind of concern and uh, that I'm gonna miss a lot of the places and I'm not gonna see it or not experience right um so tell us about your networks your personal ones and even like things that you I don't know recommend for beginners and people that are a little bit more uh deep in the journey yeah so like again communities right because and this is like even more important than many people think uh, some nomads literally they don't travel between destinations they travel between communities so it's like factor number one where they actually decide to go is that they are already some nomads so um, me I do prefer like to go to some emerging destinations because there is also You know other factors like why I'm even a nomad why I travel like I also want to experience like different cultures I want to help them like maybe to attract nomads and I also want to get better deals because uh, in established already destination so you often will struggle like to find you know like affordable accommodation all that kind of things mm-hmm. but uh, again so this is also like um, for instance for people that are introverted it's easier to be of course on their own like when they travel for some weeks maybe and extroverted people they depend more on you know other nomads or remote workers being around or integration with the local communities so you also have like co-living so co-working as options so you have to like really you know factor like how much uh, budget you have because co-livings can be like a bit pricey depending on where exactly but they are like very beneficial you know to network and to build those like maybe deeper connections because you will spend more time with people than for instance event where you just go for a few hours or at best like one week but co-living like if you stay there and live like one month with people every day you know that you can really connect with them Uh, so you it's really a lot like... of the time starting sorry about that it's a lot of yeah. the time starting like that right you're going to a conference you meet a lot of people and stuff like that and you stay in the place uh, and kind of everybody keep experience that even if the conference is like three four days or a week people staying for months over there together right yeah so now now we talk about slow madism and I think yeah this is like more sustainable way of being a nomad. So you spend at least maybe two, three months in a destination. So that's easier. You know, you don't have to all the time look for flights. Accommodations are cheaper if you book them for longer periods. But then also that allows you to already connect with some people, right? Like some people take more time. So it's not everybody like in just go out in one evening and they have five friends. So maybe some people need some time. Then for them, it's even more important like to be in the same place and go to the same gym or go to the same co-working. Co-working are often like, you know, the kind of like place that gather people around because they also organize events uh, and they connect people and they often even have like some of them online communities. So even when you leave the place, you can still be part of community. And that's actually very important. Like once you, you know, like meet the people, then you have to stay in touch, like, you know, connect, uh, follow up from time to time. So that part is more intentional. Then maybe in a um, you know settled uh, life where you anyway meet someone because you go to the same office or to the same gym or to the same club every week it doesn't happen as a nomad it's rare we cannot count on that that we're gonna meet in the next yeah. destination maybe we will maybe we will not so if I really want you know to um, to keep the connection then I have to think about that like you Let's actually talk about traveling together to next destination or let's meet somewhere maybe in half a year uh, or let's have a call from time to time. And that also goes for the friends that you had before being a nomad yep. because sometimes mm-hmm. you know like it can be so funny and so much traveling and so many new things that some people actually kind of lose the connections they had before. And then they realize like, well, I know lots of people, but I don't really have close friends, right? Because it's now very intentional. It will not happen naturally. You are the one that left. So you have to plan some time for that. Like no matter how busy the life gets, like your close friends, there has to be a time for them. Like 
mm, you have to connect with them, you have to talk. You know, I have a friend with Poland, so we talk actually every week, no matter where I am. That doesn't change just because I went to another country. And that's way how you stay connected. And if then I have a problem, I can always reach out. I don't feel like, oh, but we haven't been talking in half a year, then it's now, yeah. Uh, so a lot of intentionality and planning, which is actually mm, different because most people, how they make friends, they just let it happen, right? And they become friends with people that surround them. But as a nomad, you have to be more conscious. Otherwise, you're gonna end in the situation where you know lots of people but no close connections or you you know them yeah. but you don't keep them in your life right yeah, yeah. so kind of facebook friends kind of thing yeah um, <laughs> um yeah I, i'm totally connected to that like i mean you really need to go and put yourself out there i mean again going out of your comfort zone uh, it is part of it it is part of the journey um because if you're not gonna go and actually you know make the first step uh, as you mentioned like as a nomad it's like almost impossible it's not always like the it's not like only the first step but it's actually keep and maintain this relationship yeah uh, and of course we are like meeting a lot of amazing people all over and it's really depend on you know the the bond and the connection that you're having with a person and try to kind of i don't know at least me i'm trying to kind of you know i don't want to say that call but calculate um like my time because it is like a huge part of being a digital nomad your business friends your kind of experienced friends and your actual friends that's gonna keep going with you like along the way and uh, i can say that i have still friends from australia that we're speaking on a weekly basis like it was seven years ago six years ago and okay. we still like getting in touch on a weekly like bi-weekly basis and so yeah so those like the the experience or the relationship that that you know that stay with us uh, i think it's the most special relationship that we're gonna experience um at least for me um all right so first of all thank you so much a lot of gems over here for nomades um of course that you're like consulting to a nomad right uh, so it's part of being a nomad yourself and you're probably seeing a lot of cases of people that just starting and a lot of people that are again deep into the game um what would you recommend one thing for someone that is really into it and is struggling um let's say either i think the biggest concern that we are so far it's either my business i want to scale it up i want to make a little bit more to to be a little bit more in short with that um i find it hard to move around and stay productive uh, or fix up with hours with my clients or obviously with my project um what do you think is the most important thing? Like, where should people start with when they actually looking to grow a little bit there, you know, from a small business to a mid-size and even bigger, but keep everything online? Yeah, so it a lot comes to the routines, right? Because when we start like nomad life, it's sometimes very chaotic because then you, I have seen people like, you know, going without any plan, but you change the country and the whole life change. Uh, your routines change, like you don't eat healthy, you don't do any sport, like mm, you do your work at different time. And this is super hard because uh, motivation, you know, it's unstable. So someday you may work more, but then the other days you don't feel like doing that. Distractions are so many, right? Because you are in a new country, you would like to go and see. So I think like establishing like the routines mm, as a nomad, it's even more important than in as a settled person because when you live in one place, in some way, because you belong to certain ecosystem, you already have some, you know, patterns or routines. Like uh, some of them, your family set for them, or maybe your partner or your friends or your boss, and you just participating and it's, it works to some extent. When you know, like leave the whole ecosystem and you go to another country, so you have to do that all yourself, right? like being uh, productive, taking care of the work um, or business area, then like your health, personal area, and then, um, yeah, the social one, which were like the big three that you really need to think about it. 
and the the productive one the business it, it relies a lot about having like the structure and the routine so you can change the country but your routine should stay the same like you work within these hours you know like you you should find like the time to exercise you should eat healthy no matter what and uh, it also may help like to have a group for some accountability so if you go to for some people for instance uh, going to co-working hubs because they feel like more productive there and they feel like surrounded by other people that works there right and they can also maybe even network and meet someone that actually will help them with their business so that may work great but some older people, they actually more productive when they are alone at home and nobody distracts them. So it also comes to knowing yourself. But uh, whatever you find, you have to keep them. And then, like, you know, processes, automation of the things that you don't have to do everything. For scaling the business, um, hiring the right people, right? Because a lot of people, they try to do everything by themselves. But then eventually the time is limited and you are, you know, you may be actually good at some things, but not so great at others. And you spend hours like some people, they do social media by themselves, but they also write copy by themselves. And then they go to Canva and they try to design their own um, website, which is perfectly possible. But that it takes a lot of time because you are not expert on that. Not always. It's so great. <laughs> And uh, the problem with that, that you are not working in your genius zone. Maybe actually, you know, you want to coach people or you want to program or you want, you know, to, to write. But then you are doing all of the other things um, which you are not necessarily excellent at, but you are wasting the time that you could actually be doing what you're really great. Because eventually mm -hmm. doing more of what you're really good is, and doing less of uh, what you are not so good and delegating that or, you know, uh, hiring other people for that. And hiring yeah, doesn't even mean, it. yeah, just, uh, just like, you know, for a few hours for something, it doesn't even has to be big decision. Like I need to hire someone or I don't have the budget. You just, you know, assign for a few hours and then you focus on what's more important and you keep to, you know, your plan and your routine. And then again, I think scaling a business is actually uh, tricky because not even everybody is ready. Like you may be, you know, good at some service, uh, but you might not necessarily have the business skills, right? Like depends where you come from. A lot of people like, you know, designers or programmers or marketing people, they, they have like skills that are in demand. But if you want to build a small agency, then um, a new set of skills is actually necessary, like the project management, you know, the communication, uh, how to deal with clients, uh, accounting. So all that, uh, again, like the basics you can learn or you can decide what you need to learn. If not, then you have to outsource or get some people to help you. Um, there are also like, you know, lots of workshops uh, in nomad communities about that exactly, like how to set the business or how to scale or what to do if you have a specific problem. So you can sometimes even without big budget, like, you know, maybe you provide something for someone and they provide you back what you need. Uh, you can like find uh, help in support, but scaling will be a lot about that, like, you know, uh, organizing and focusing on what's really important, setting like the right processes, acquiring like the skills for actually business management, not just selling your product and then getting um, the people on board. Like once you have some budget for that, like getting the right people. Beautiful. All righty. Um, yes, it's not easy. Uh, a little bit intimidating, but again, uh, if you're doing it like smart or you're doing it the right way with the right support, um, I'm sure that, you know, everyone, I mean, again, it really depends on why you, what you want to achieve because a lot of the people that I meet, and especially the creative one, uh, that coming from creative don't actually want to scale out. They're good with something that is really solid and really good for themselves. They don't need the, the trouble, the headache. But the ones that actually do, um, it's better to do it organized. It's better to do it with the right support. Uh, if it's yeah. someone that can help you on the basic side or just mindset, because it's a lot about that as well. Um, and obviously, business plan is always good. <laughs> um, I actually touch an important topic here that uh, there is now also a concept like lifestyle business, right? 
So, mm-hmm. and then there are those people that actually they have enough clients or income, but they don't necessarily want to grow and make a company out of that. Maybe they are one person or sometimes they're like one person, but they have some help, maybe one or two people or they outsource some things, but mostly they deal with everything by themselves. Yep. And then, I mean, of course, like if you got to that point that you can already leave out of that and it's stable, right? And, and it's stable over time. Uh, then it's a personal decision because uh, growing also will require more of your time, at least at at the beginning, maybe like for a few years, at least I think two, three years minimum, it will require more of your time. So, but it also can provide more income. So it's, then it's a very personal decision if it's worth, right? If that effort is worth. Uh, but like having a lifestyle business, which is like, you know, some coaches or consultants, like, they just like one person business but like enough and serving the their life and then we have like this concept also like lifestyle design right so you first have to know and that's where it always come back to the point you have to know what's important to you because like when you know that then all these decisions that maybe comes um further on the road they are easier to respond. Like if you know what's your guidance, like if my guidance is as much free time as possible, then I don't want to scale the business, right? But if my uh, guidance may be sexually impact um, and, you know, helping more people, maybe I do, right? Because maybe I want to grow and maybe I want to be more known. So it depends on what, more people. what yeah. matters. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Um, knowing like what's your dream lifestyle, uh, I think it's uh, this is the starting point, or not a dream lifestyle, or maybe what's right for me. Um, even if like it's pushed me a little bit out of the comfort zone, push me a little bit for that. Um, all right, I uh, love the point of view. Um, all right, let's let's talk a little bit about how is it to be a nomad. Uh, first of all, let's start. Let's take another step back and talk about you as a nomad. How is it uh, to be a nomad yourself? Like, what, what is your routine? The things that are really important uh, in your day to day. Um, and obviously, tell us a little bit more about your coaching uh, program and everything that you're actually doing. Well, so for me, uh, it's really, really important, you know, like to keep the balance uh, between like the work time and personal one. And that means that like, you know, on you, for instance, uh, it's like four or five, then it's personal time. And if you haven't finished, then you finish next day. Like you don't stay until eight or nine because that's you haven't, you know, left the office to be close at home, especially that I work alone (laughs) at home. So then getting out after the work is even more important. And then it's like, yeah, afternoons, uh, I like to engage like in some sport or dance activities and evenings, like some social life uh, meetups. Um, If there are no events, I also organize my own because that's also a way to go, right? Like, uh, yeah, (laughs) you can you can lead, right? So uh, you can create more of what you want. And also I try always to uh, connect with local communities where I am because you can't rely only on nomads. Uh, Maybe they are, maybe they are not. And anyway, it benefits you more like, you know, to have local friends and nomads friends. So like mixed group of network. And that's something like, you know, you have to be always very conscious because life sometimes, you know, just get busy. So you have to like remember uh, what's actually your reason why you are doing that. And then you can even make a plan. Some people make very detailed plan. I don't, but I ha- always keep that in my mind that my social life is important. You know, so like if I, I for instance, uh, I told you I have a friend in Poland. So we actually have a meetings, like weekly meetings. And this is like work time. This is already set. And it's not like if it happens and if I have time, then we talk. No, we have the set time. We confirmed. <laughs> it's like booked and we meet because this is important for me, right? And um, actually, like, you know, uh, the community and being close to people is eventually what makes you feel uh, happy even more than work. So... It's great to be satisfied and appreciated by what you do, but if you feel isolated, 
which is, by the way, number one nomad problem, uh, loneliness, right? Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. lonely. So yeah, you have to really think, mm, because when you already feel lonely, then it's kind of late. Like you have to work on not feel like that and build a network, uh, think about your friends. So all that. Um, yeah, so I basically make sure that there is uh, always space every day for what matters to me. Um, and professionally, yes, so um, I coach like nomads, uh, I mentor, uh, you know, how to start or how to get remote work. Um, that's on individual basis. So if someone has like uh, any kind of doubt, it's a lot about mindset, right? Or where exactly they start, because once they start, they often like realize that actually there is more things uh, to go ahead than they fall, but they have to start, right? Uh, and then, yeah, I'm also very interested, you know, in helping like destinations uh, to bring more nomads, especially emerging destinations, because everybody always goes to the same places. But there is like many amazing places that people didn't uh, went or thought about it. They are just less known, maybe not so touristy. Um, but they have like, you know, amazing conditions. Uh, people really welcome you there. So I help them, like, you know, I worked on that uh, in Croatia, I work on that in Bosnia, and we also now have a project here in Cape Verde. So this is like a nomad group program where we basically, uh, like, help people to find accommodation. We organize events and we also connect them with uh, local NGOs so they can also volunteer when they are here. And that's why they give back, but they also connect and meet friends, you know, because that's I try to always include also that element. So we are not like isolated group of white people, you know, uh, but we and they because people when they um, when they connect, uh, they actually I would say they try, you know, they feel like more satisfied. And that's partially only partially, but it's partial solution to the problem with loneliness because the problem yes. with loneliness is that you feel isolated so if you feel that you belong uh, to something and it can be also the local community it doesn't have to be necessarily something you left in your country but you have to belong to someone because humans are social creatures right and if you feel that you are doing something you know like maybe some small acts that make someone uh, else life better then traveling also becomes more meaningful. So we are also trying people to help with that. And when I coach the destination, I also focus on that because they don't even think that's something important, like connect them with local communities, you know, give them possibilities to, to meet them, um, you know, to do something together uh, or give back or, you know, maybe even network or some people haven't found clients like that, you know, because they just... Uh, or service providers, you know, you are nomading somewhere, you meet people and say like, well, so actually I need a website and there you have like people, right? And often that's uh, great prices because, you know, you're in different destinations. So all that. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Beautiful. So it's really interesting, like really uh, something special that you're doing, especially with NGO, especially with like connecting to the community and help as much as possible. Um, and this is something really nice because I really do feel that it's connecting to the culture of the place. You always want to go. It's not only about land. It's not only about view. It's not only about attraction. Uh, it's about the people a lot of the time. So over here, I really, when we came to Atitlan, to San Pedro, uh, we started uh, one week in, you know, the high place, the tourist place and stuff like that. Really didn't like it. It's not my kind of vibe. I couldn't like concentrate. I couldn't work. I couldn't like do anything. And then we moved to the other part, which is like much more local, and it's like local community only. And barely you're gonna see foreigners over here. And um, and over here it's much like relaxed. Like you you really feel it. I'm speaking much more Spanish than I used to. Uh, I used to speak only English. Now I'm actually getting better. Um, so it's like giving you something that's giving like different motivation. Um, and I totally like with the idea of connecting to the culture and try to do something good. Um, Because there's like, you know, they're so nice to kind of have us in this place. Uh, this is what I think, at least. Um, tolerate a lot of the Western kind of, you know, things that we're doing. Um, so why not give it back? Why not to actually try to help and to do something good for someone that is completely a stranger? Um, 
So yeah, so I totally love that. Um, let's jump into Cape Verde. You mentioned it. Uh, tell us uh, what you're actually doing that and how is it to as an actual like moment destination? Uh, yeah, so that's my, I'm currently in Cape Verde. Um, I spend the winter here and, and we have the project with Nomad Equis, which is, by the way, one of Nomad communities that people that are new can join. The community is for free, but some events, if you want to attend, then you pay something accordingly. So we have a program here that I mentioned, and we basically trying like to bring more nomads here. That's uh, emerging nomad destination. And also, you know, like make them feel connected, um, yeah, and uh, enjoy the experience. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's quite a new thing because it only started like last year. Um, mm -hmm. At the beginning, it's lots of work because people often go to the established destination, you know, like people always go to the same places, like where are most nomads now? It's like... Uh, yeah, Thailand, Indonesia, and maybe Mexico, and then next winter they also go there. But I believe because we also became nomads, you know, many of us, because we wanted to see something else, like, oh, we wanted something more out of life. So I think like, you know, also a little bit, I for sure have, have that, but I think many people have that. They just sometimes maybe a bit afraid, uh, like, you know, that's uh, actually adventure spirit, like, so let's try something new, as long as we can work there. So there are like those two big factors, like that people need to be sure they can do their work if they go somewhere else, maybe this is Africa, like, so, so many people are a bit afraid, oh, will the internet work? And then another factor is like, are there other nomads? As always, like, will I be alone if I go there? So, like always when you want to attract the nomads, you have to um, make sure that they know that those conditions are met and like, yeah, we're not going to be alone. We have like, you know, the group for you. We're going to connect you with local people because that's also a way like, you know, when you're only starting and there is no like hundreds of nomads yet. So you can, um, you know, organize events like together with people that from maybe moved here, like expats, also local people and then nomads. And then you can get a bigger group, but also like more interesting group. I think that's why, right? Because then you have like interesting mix of people and backgrounds and you don't necessarily need like 200 of nomads to go somewhere to make, uh, to give them an amazing experience. Yeah. So how many people are actually, are you guys in uh, Cape, in Cape Verde? Sorry. Like in, in our group, maybe like 15 or, or 20, but that's only the ones that, you know, I know and connected to us. But they are also nomads that came individually, people that work remotely, don't identify as nomads, and uh, they came by themselves. That we don't really know how many. But right now, Cape Verde is full because it's carnival here. So it's like a very difficult in February. There are no more accommodations. <laughs> Because also like a lot of, you know, tourists, but also um, because Cape Verdeans particularly, a lot of them live actually abroad. So maybe even more of them live abroad than in their countries, but they often come back. So then they also travel a lot. There is like a lot of migration and especially where we are in Mindelo, where they have like amazing carnival. So right now it's really full <laughs> of people. All right. Yeah. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. Uh, Carnival, it's always good. Um, tell me how you actually picked Cape Verde, like how you find the destination. Well, actually, by my network. <laughs> so again, example why, why it's good to connect, right? Because uh, I'm a friend with uh, Gonzalo Hall. That, uh, so he is actually a nomad leader. And he, I don't know if you ever heard, but he actually uh, created like the nomad village in Madeira, in Portugal. And that, that's, oh, wow. yeah, the, the, the concept is quite actually known because, you know, um, then lots of newspapers wrote about it. So it's like it, it happened during pandemic time and there were no tourists, people were not traveling, but nomads still has to live somewhere because that's our life, right? So it's, it, it's not just like traveling. So then uh, in those times, he actually opened and created that. And then the idea came that we can actually scale that concept and do that in other places, right? And he started actually here in Cape Verde, and then I joined, and now we are collaborating on bringing more people. And then he also has like the concept also the same for Brazil. 
So it's like, uh, you know, bringing people in group and then providing and preparing the whole ecosystem by when they come and then you are basically like in a nomad village. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah building goody. a village takes time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right. So if we already start, so tell us like, the full thing, the full program in Cape Verde. Uh, how does it look like? What are you guys taking care of? And uh, tell us a little bit more so we can actually have a link over here on the screen later on uh, for people that are actually interesting as well. Yeah, so it's uh, we basically like you make sure uh, to find accommodations for people. So they, they kind of book like a program that everything is included. So it's... Uh, accommodation co-working like the events um, that I organize you know I connect them whenever they need and um, yeah and then if they have like any questions you know we all also support them like about visas or whatever they need to do so it's it's easier for them to come because maybe like traveling from one European country to other is easier you don't really have to do much right but when it comes to going to Africa a lot of people they are you know, like, um, not they sure. Want, yeah, they, yeah. And the fact that there is already group and they can trust someone and someone takes care of them. So that makes it easier for some people because they, especially because you have to work eventually, right? So you need to rely that other nomads are already there and they, you know, tested the infrastructure that things are working. Also, that you are safe there. And then again, that you are not lonely, big factor. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, of yeah. Course. So people just, you find them like houses and people, uh, I don't know, coming and renting or everybody living in the same place kind of thing? Uh, some people, they, there are like, you know, some places that like studios that are in the same buildings, for instance, but uh, then there are some uh, rooms or some studios in another building because we don't really have here like the place where everybody could stay together. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, accommodation uh, can be actually quite difficult to find in Africa sometimes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. in general, I think this is like the number one thing as well that concerns traveler, like not only travelers, especially nomads and experts that are going to stay for a while. So when we came here, um, we actually didn't know how this place looking like. Uh, we, we kind of gamble on the place. Um, it was a good gamble, I got to say, but uh, it's happened a lot of the times that you're not sure where you're going to. So obviously a group and everything that you're doing, you're kind of the middleman that's helping like the support, the back support. Um, that's actually a great idea, a great thing that you're doing. Um, and sorry, uh, guys, if you want to join or to hear more details, we're going to have in the description and hopefully on the screen as well, uh, Anna's uh, a link. Uh, you can speak with her. Obviously, it's going to be great if anyone from the Kanana community going to as well uh, get interested in these kind of things. Um, all right. So we already um, cover all of the basic of no meeting. We cover like the expert tips for no meeting. We spoke a little bit about your uh, project in Cape Verde. Um, Let's talk about the Balkans. Uh, I know that you've traveled quite a bit over there. Um, tell us how it's to be a nomad over there, How, like, what you actually did as well. It's something really important. And most importantly, like, where is the, you know, the gem, the hidden gem in Balkan that everybody must go and find? Uh, yeah, so it's um, the hidden gem. It's again depends like what you like. Um, a lot of people actually like Croatia uh, because they they have amazing coastline. They have lots of islands, so you can do sailing there. Uh, then depends like a lot of people go to Split, but then other people go to Zagreb because it's more like city. Zagreb, for instance, has much more offer during the whole year, and Split is more seasonal. Uh, then uh, I also loved Montenegro. Montenegro for me might be like if we only talked about beauty, might be the most beautiful country in Europe. It's really amazing. Like the nature is outstanding. So then you have like yeah yeah, it's more nature places. location. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, and uh, you could do like you know kind of road trips that would be really interesting around that coastline, or you could do also maybe boat trip around the coastline. Um, so 
think that it's the same coastline the Croatia that Italy has. So the Italian one is very known, but the Croatian one it's less known. And then if you go south, which is Albanian, which is again the same um, sea, right? So then it's like nobody knows there and people pay like way more money to go to Italy uh, to actually be on the same sea, just on other side. So Balkans are kind of underestimated in general. Um, I was actually in October, I think, uh, on a project also in Bosnia and Herzegovina that was like a pilot program for digital nomads because they only started now and they want to attract more nomads. So we were like, um, yeah, giving feedback and checking uh, the infrastructure and also like experiences what they already have and how it would be for nomads. So they, that's really, really, Bosnia is very underestimated because it's, I was particularly in Mostar, so it's amazing town, like very beautiful, a lot of things to do, very affordable and also very good base. Like for instance, if you stay for a few months in Balkans, then you could have like, you know, base there and travel to some other countries. Even to the coastline, it's very close because it's maybe in two hours actually on the coastline. So um, yeah, Balkans really and Albania, like Tirana is actually also a place to be. But depends, you know, like because Tirana is a bigger city. So then again, like, do you like to be in a city or do you like to be in a smaller town? Because me, for instance, I love to be on islands or I love to be on some maybe smaller town, not super small, but maybe, you know, uh, not big towns. I find like better lifestyle there and better connection to nature. So that's, yeah, there are a lot of places like I think people can really mm -hmm. find, depends what they need. Or they can even go like, you know, and travel different countries and check actually. But it will be um, generally Balkan countries, they are much more affordable than, you know, like okay. everybody goes to Portugal or Spain. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. But then um, you have like, yeah, Croatia or you have Montenegro. I think they are equally beautiful, but definitely cheaper if you know like where to go and find the right places. And, and right. definitely you are also much more welcome because it's also not only the cost, but the experience you are getting. You know, when you are going to the place that there are like uh, thousands of nomads, you are just one more. And sometimes locals um, even against because maybe they already, you know, uh, they are already like a bit uh, tired of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. go to those places that are that actually want to bring nomads, then they treat you like a special guest. You know, like when we went to Bosnia and Herzegovina, like people really went out of their way. We literally had like all newspapers, radio and television and like the biggest IT companies in Bosnia and Herzegovina contacting us because they heard that nomads came to their country so they wanted to like you know, oh some interview or meetings <laughs> and yeah so but can you imagine that i don't know i go to germany and spain and everybody does that because nobody yeah. cares right so mm -hmm. you know experience is different like why would i go somewhere when they don't want me like people go to play at the carmen but the locals write on the walls like nomads go to your country so I prefer to go somewhere where people actually, you know, welcome me and they say like, it's amazing that you came here, like tell us more about yourself. Experience for me is very important. Beauty. Wow. That's giving like a lot of different questions, but let me start with the, maybe the most important one. Um, we said it, it's affordable. We know it's like the Balkans are a little bit more affordable, like much more affordable than you, like, you know, other side of Europe. Um, what should like a true or nomad or an accent should expect like uh, in a matter of monthly spending uh, is this under the rate of 1000 2000 3000 as a nomad we kind of have this thing in the show uh, we're trying to find the location in the scale and fix it up later on and um, so how much would you say like a couple gonna spend in in the Balkan in the Balkan countries Depends, uh, again, like how they want to live um, and which city, right? But if, uh, you know, like if some people uh, don't spend that much, you know, like on experiences or don't eat maybe too much in restaurants, I think it's perfectly possible to spend less than 1000 But you have to be a bit, a lot, it's accommodation, right? So it's, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in Mostar, for instance, there are places 
if you stayed for longer, you could rent for like uh, 400 or 500 euros uh, studio, no? Small studio, yeah. So that's that's already your biggest expense. And then mm -hmm. you perfectly possible to live for 500. If you, of course, go to split, probably you it's hard to spend, um, I mean, yeah. probably at least 1,500. But depends, uh, again, like if you go in summer, then accommodations. But then you have also other options. Like you have another city, which is Zadar. It's more north of Croatia. It's not so popular. It's also nice, but not so popular. Then it's cheaper. So it's... You can spend 1,000, uh, you can spend probably 1,500 euros. If you go in the season and want amazing accommodation, you can spend 2,000, but it's, uh, it really depends on how you want to live. But over 1,000, for instance, um, yeah. Um, so 1,000 minimum, 2,000, 2,500 at most? 2,000, you, you really live like a king, you know? <laughs> That's like a king, okay, cool. Uh, like a king. With the, with <laughs> this the is what we like to hear. With the view... Uh, for the sea and all that so but 1000 is because you know accommodation when you rent them on weekly or monthly basis they are more expensive than if you stay them for half a year for instance or year right so we have to count on that so it's it's not possible in western europe or even south europe anymore for you to spend just 1000 if you're only going somewhere and spending their amount you know like if you go to Lisbon or Barcelona now, or even other cities, it's just because they're going to ask you 1,000 only for flat. So yep. uh, th yep. th there is where Absolutely. the difference relies. All right. So we have pretty much like cost of living over there. That's great. Um, let's talk about, you know, general condition like uh, Internet. Um, how is it for, I don't know, someone did not speak in the language to go around or people speaking English over there? Uh, how is the culture in general? Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, people are really warm and welcoming because it's really special thing for them. Um, but what about the big city? What is on the day-to-day -day, uh, for a person that is not from there? How easy is it to go around? I think so. The, the only bigger city where I've been living was probably Zagreb uh, because I, since I'm a nomad, I actually avoid living in big cities because I, you know, I left them. And since before, you know, like you had to go to the office because the work was in the big city. But now that I can choose, I I find better balance in uh, smaller towns. But Zagreb is actually very easy to live and very affordable um, as per capital. So that, that's definitely a place. It's just not on the coast. Some people prefer to be on the coast. That's why they pay more in split, for instance. But um in, in other countries, so you need, um, internet is actually pretty decent, but I always recommend people they check, you know, their own accommodation, because it's if you go to some remote place, um, then you know the internet in the country as a whole can be decent, but maybe your host didn't con uh, contract the right speed, so you have to check. And it's good to be specific, uh, right? Like if you can get the screenshot, that's way better than them saying the internet is good because what does that even mean good, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, depends what you do because some people need more than others, right? A lot of people, they don't really need uh, such a high speed. What they need is just internet is stable so the calls don't fall. But, you know, like emails and general work usually doesn't require that much, but... Some professions, they may need a bit more. So if you need more, then you have to be more careful, right? And you need to have like some backup plan, maybe your SIM or router, or you know where it's like the closest co-working if you figure out that um, it's not that great. But, you know, like the recent, uh, maybe when I started, I still struggled to a bit with that. But now, even here in Cape Verde, I don't really have problems. I didn't have problems in Africa. I don't have any special demands, right? We are having this call in Africa, right? <laughs> it didn't fall so far. So I don't think it's a big barrier anymore. Perhaps very in the underdeveloped countries, but they are not even in Europe, uh, those kind of countries. So internet, it stopped being a barrier. But you, of course, should double check, you know, especially for important uh, meetings or things with the... Yep. 
All right. And how is like um, the culture over there in the Balkans? People speak in English. Uh, like I found over here, that it's pretty hard to go around only like with English. I really need to, you know, push myself with a Spanish side and really learn fast as well. Because yeah. if no, like you have no way to even order, you know, food in a restaurant. Um, so how is it over there in, in the Balkans? So I think, uh, yeah, again, depends a bit where, but Croatian and Bosnians, they speak uh, quite a good English. So that's great. I think Slovenia, some people include, or in Romania, they speak some English. Where I found the bigger difficulty was actually Albania. They don't. Then uh, some of them actually you may manage with some Italian in Albania, if you happen <laughs> to know that. But English is, is more of a challenge. Um, yeah, Montenegro, they also speak some English. So that's, um, yeah. It's probably, you know, always useful if you knew any Slavic language, then you could understand a bit. You know, I'm mm-hmm. actually Polish, so even if Croatian is different thing, but, you know, sometimes I understand some things. So it's, it's also helps. Uh, so if someone yep. speaks, for instance, Russian, you know, or Czech, that, that's also be some hint um mm-hmm. but language yeah language sometimes can be a barrier of course like depending uh, where we are or who is coming right uh, then again it's uh when there is a language barrier then we need more intermediaries right because we we can do everything ourselves so then for instance some countries they croatia has actually digital nomad association croatia which is actually in geo that nomads can contact and, you know, like make questions about visas or accommodations or meetups or things like that. And um, this is more needed if there is language barrier than if not, right? Because, of course, they, they do much more than that, but you depend more intermediary um, organization on them if uh, there is language barrier. But uh, some countries also start to realize that because these associations, they were... It's not like every country has them, but few countries already has them. You know, that was two years ago. There was no such mm-hmm. a thing. So yep. Portugal also it's... has now one. So, you know. You yeah, have... uh, I think a lot of the countries like turning that way, uh, especially now when a lot of them start to offer nomad visas. Uh, as well. Uh, I heard a couple of countries uh, in Europe are actually planning to do that. Spain uh, actually planning to do it over 2023. Uh, I know that Greece uh, already started something. I'm not 100% sure about it, but I know that it's really in the process. Um, so this is amazing. Like the visa is a big barrier, like a big barrier as well. Uh, either if you're coming for a couple of months and you need to do the visa run, the famous visa run, um, or to find a solution uh, uh, that is not like the easiest or let's say you don't actually want to do that. So no mid visa. Uh, how, how much do you think it's going to change the way uh, people actually treating right now to this problem? Visas, um, yeah, well, obviously they are necessary because some some people have, you know, weaker passports than others. So then, uh, then of course, depends where you go. And then also some people want to stay longer and maybe the tourist visa only gives them one month or maybe at best three months. So then if they have that option, it's great. But a lot of these visas, you know, they are still very restrictive in a sense that either you have to have a high income Oh, it's quite difficult to get them. It's like long process uh, and maybe not not very well thought for nomads because some of them, for instance, ask you like, you know, some proofs, where do you live? Um, I think like criminal background. And so if this, for instance, you know, like I wouldn't even know as a nomad where to look for that. Like, where do I ask for a criminal background, right? This mm-hmm. like, I'm not even living anymore in my country. Where do I go? So this is a lot of hassle in many cases. So... As long as many nomads can avoid these visas, they don't ask for them unless it's like very necessary. Uh, but it's also important to mention that visa is also being used as a marketing tool. Yeah. So it's because people think only like ah, because they want to bring nomads or, or remote workers. But uh, actually, yep. it's especially well worked for the countries that were, you know, pioneers in that. Uh, Croatia, I think, was actually the second one in Europe, because only Estonia had that. But 
uh, it went really big because of that, because everybody started talking about that country as a nomad destination. So even if you then uh, they don't have like, I don't know, uh, many thousands of people applying for the visa, but it still creates a, you know, um, halo effect or marketing effect because people realize, people start to think, they are writing newspaper about visas. So many countries treat that as a tool um, to show the world that they are actually working on that and that they are trying to bring people. Even if not necessarily so many people apply, it still built awareness about the destination as a known. And then I guess uh, some of those visas, they actually filter people, right? Because then actually they're not really for all the nomads, but maybe for investors or actually remote workers or people in certain situations that actually want to move there and change tax residency. And for many people, they are still not available in this way because like, you know, we are talking about someone that starts freelancing and got few clients. They're not going to get many of those visas because you cannot prove your income, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's, you know, it's still, it's good that they are there. It's, it's more options. Also more people talk about that, you know, people also push back and they say like, you need to create another visa. Uh, or different visa and country state is, mm, yeah, try actually to compete nowadays. So then it's also a factor that maybe some of them, because of the competition, will create like a better product next time. Because when you were the first one, you know, like you could put whatever conditions you wanted because you were the first one, right? And that was already a big thing. Uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. The, the struggle. And I think it's going to take us like a few more years to digest the new situation that kind of the pandemic dragged into the world and um, a lot of remote jobs and a lot of uh, nomads and experts are actually looking for a solution and i think the country start to realize the business uh, with it uh, they really start to yeah uh, to go and kind of offer the country and if let's say 10 20 30 years ago it was totally about like you know our tourist destination and come visit and come visit now it's come live in in croatia come live yeah. in, in estonia in armenia um and it's really bluff change i i really love it because it just takes us closer to a little bit more open world and less boundaries and less borders uh, i mean um and obviously it's gonna be like more collective uh which i can't wait for the day that you know you can just move and everything gonna be like much easier in that matter um all right um so i think uh, we pretty much uh, got it all today uh first of all anna and uh, that was amazing interview thank you so much so many gems so many uh info and and motivation uh, we really appreciate you joining uh, and being with us um I'm sure that if anything, uh, you know, that to take from this interview is honestly, you need a support, you need a network, you need to jump in and put yourself out there. And if you actually need to need the, the help uh, in any sort of way, uh, there are a lot of people that can help you and support you, uh, like you, Anna, uh, that actually it's blessed what you're doing. Um, and yeah, and I think this is it. Um, Gorlini Kanana, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, if you have any question for Anna, uh, we will surely start invite her when we're gonna start doing the live show uh, and things that obviously, if you're gonna agree and would like to join uh, for another session. Um, so any questions that you have, please send it over, please comment. Uh, we will sure uh, try to get everything organized and send it to Anna even to follow up with that. Um, and that's it, Anna. Uh, any last thing that you would like to say to the community? Uh, so, well, if someone wants to connect with me, then you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, like if there are any questions. If someone is interested in Cape Verde, I can also share a link. Uh, we have this program. And yeah, so I'm happy to share and to help. And yeah, follow Kurlini Kanana for more. <laughs> and we're going to continue. <laughs> so thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you.